Let's see, who do we have? We have Miguel, Miguel Batista. Yes. And looking at the length weight relationship of North Atlantic Mola, Mola. Hi. Future research on uh, Mola subspecies in the Northeast Atlantic. So we're staying in the Northeast Atlantic. Hello, Miguel. Hi. Um, uh, nice. Hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's it's really great to meet. Well, not in person, but live at least. Yes. Yes. Um, after all this back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been a it's been a very fun process. Thank you so much for inviting me for the for the book. Oh, oh, yes, my pleasure. So uh, Miguel is um, got his doctorate in marine sciences, working on this ocean sunfish, the bioecology and elemental composition of ocean sunfish, and and now he's a contracted researcher in Portugal, and um, and you are based. What's the name of your organization that you're based at again? Miguel? Uh, well, the, the acronym is MARE. It's... Um, oh, MARE, that's right. Actually, we always say the acronym. I'm not sure about the, the total mm -hmm. name, but it's a marine, a marine and environmental um, group. Yeah, Pretty yeah. Much. Yeah. All right. Well, we're looking really looking forward to your talk, and we'll just well, let you... Um, I'll do my best. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me just... Wait. Just need to share the screen. Okay. All right. So I'm going to present, like the doctor said, I'm going to present the length weight relationship of North Atlantic Mola Mola. And then I'm going to talk about future research that I would like to conduct um, in the Northeast Atlantic. So I'm going to talk about these, uh, the language relationship and on behalf of my colleagues and myself. So with regard to the late length weight relationships, what are they? Uh, well, as the name implies, they are a relationship between the length and the body of fish in this case. Um, they, they are expressed in this uh, equation. It's similar to an exponential one. We, in the graph, you can see we have the data points, and then we um, make a, a regression that uh, represents those points. Length weight relationships, together with the length at age, length at first maturity, and then fecundity data, allow for the recognition of different biological traits of fish, which is extremely important for studying population dynamics and assessing fish stocks. To date, three studies have looked into the length weight relationship of Mola Mola. However, they were all conducted either in Japanese or Korean waters. Also, um, since at the time there was, uh, it wasn't sure, uh, it was not known that there was this Mola Mola and Mola Shandrini um, issue, because now nowadays we know that they both uh, coexist. Uh, we're not sure, we could not be sure in these uh, works whether it was one species or the other. However, on the work of Watanabe and Sato, um, they, they, they know that it was just Mola Mola. So we're gonna consider this, um, Regression, this uh, relationship has the North Pacific one. Still, Mola Mola is a cosmopolitan species, uh, as we all know, and uh, the length, the, the relationships vary depending on the geographical location. So, for example, here we can see a graph, it's Skipjack Tuna, and you can see that depending on the ocean, there's different length weight relationships. So, the objective of this work was to provide for the first time a length weight relationship for North, North, North Atlantic uh, Mola Mola. We obtained total length and total weight data from 15 small mola specimens that were captured in the south of Portugal on the tuna set net. And then we went on uh, to the literature to, kept, to get um, data on larger specimens. Still, there's the question whether it's mola mola or mola chandrini. So to, to resolve that issue, we, we performed phylogenetic analysis using the loop sequences of mitochondrial DNA for the small specimens, the one that were captured. And then for the large ones, we identify them through morphometric features such as body depth and total body depth. So these specimens from the literature, we just searched for larger than 100 centimeters because that's when you can actually tell the difference between species. And we use no estimates, any number that seemed like an estimate or a suspicious round value, we didn't use. This yielded a total of nine specimens. And here you can see um, how we were certain that they are indeed mola mola. We can see that the body depth uh, on the on the left, we have body depth on the right, total body depth. 
the dashed line, it's the regression for Moa Alexandrini and the darker line for Moa Moa. And the white circles represent the, um, represent the data from the Moa that we gather from the, from the literature. So we can actually be sure they are Moa Moa. So indeed, we obtained the length weight relationship with an R square of 0 0.998. So it means that this relationship represents very well the data. And we observe that uh, the North Atlantic relationship is different than the, the one from the North Pacific. The, the North Atlantic one is less steep, as you can see in the graph, which, in, which means that there's a lower increase in weight as the fish grows in uh, length. But we know that uh, there are three main factors that affect uh, fish growth, genetic makeup, food availability, and water temperature. With regard to genetic makeup, we know that the Atlantic and Pacific Moa Moa are genetically distinct. Uh, at Suru and Marianne, we're just talking about it. Um, so this uh, divergence is very likely uh, responsible for the differences in the length weight relationships, um, has distinct morphological features derived from genotypic differences. So that the, the North Pacific fish are thicker in body. Also, um, as food availability go, we know that um, in fish, well, not, not just in fish, but uh, greater food supply results in greater weight increase. And if we go back to the graph, we can see that the divergence starts between 80 and 100 centimeters long, which is uh, a size where we know there's a dietary ontogenic shift in which fish start to uh, consume more gelatinous well plankton. So, we also know that in the North Pacific, there's a greater biomass of um, gelatinous soil plankton, which means that if there's more food availability, it's likely that the fish will get, uh, will increase great, more greatly in, in, in weight. When it comes to water temperature, um, it is known that the physiology of ectotherms is intimately connected with the environmental temperature, and therefore there's an optimum temperature for growth. Still, uh, between the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, there's just a slight variation in temperature, just one degree in which the Pacific is slightly colder. So temperature should not be a, a main factor um, resulting in this divergence in the late weight relationships. In conclusion, um, so we believe that this divergence, uh, this interoceanic divergence is mainly caused by differences in the genetic makeup and the differences in food availability. And by providing this length, length weight relationship for North Atlantic fish, we, we expect this to be a small step, another one uh, follow, uh, mounting on the research that has been conducted for the health assessment of the North Atlantic population. Now, um, I would like to talk about the future research, some topics that I would like to conduct in the future. And disclaimer, this is my, it's my thoughts, not the rest of the team. So if I say something dumb, it's, it's my fault. So first question, if there are subpopulations of molar species in the, um, along the latitudinal gradient in the North Atlantic or the Northeast, abundance data uh, has shown us that there's abundant peaks of mola um, in spring and autumn in the south of Portugal and during the summer in the south of Ireland, England, and the Northwest of France. The other way, on the other hand, satellite telemetry data shows us shows us that the fish from south of Portugal to north of Spain they take more or less three months, and from the south of Ireland to the north of Spain they also to take a like more or less three months. So there is a mismatch between abundant peak, abundant abundant peaks and migratory movements, meaning that the fish that occur in spring in the south of Portugal could not go during this in the summer to this to the north of Ireland and then come back in time for the the autumn. Which begs the question, are there two subpopulations or not? Another question is, uh, relates to the relative abundance of mole species in the Northeast Atlantic. As we know, uh, and has been discussed today, there's, uh, there are now different species. Or there, has, there has always been different species, but now we are aware of them. So I think it's important to find out the relative abundance of each one in a way to assess fish stocks and then try to implement conservation measures. Third question, uh, do all mole species in the Northeast Atlantic share a common spatial, spatial origin? I mean, there's a, we all know, and Marco was just talking about the spawning ground in the Sargasso Sea, but maybe like tuna, there's another one in the Mediterranean Sea, we don't know. 
it's also uh, I think it's a re relevant question for again conservation of this of these fish. Final question: Could population size be estimated using bycatch data from uh, tuna set nets? Usually, population size estimates are performed with um, aerial surveys or boat surveys. However, they are costly. It's not easy to to have a plane going around in circles and counting the fish. So maybe we could make a, a match between the um, the bycatch daily bycatch in the tuna set net, and then have at the same time aerial survey, so that in the future we could have a low cost method to monitor population size. And that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you much for your attention, and uh, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Miguel. So so interesting. Yeah, I mean, mo it's looking like there's more and more. Um, uh, support for this difference between the um, the two mola populations. Yes, indeed. Uh, Etsu was talking about that, and that it makes total sense uh, taking into account this data. So there's mm -hmm. definitely something going on. Um, yeah, yeah. So those differences you know in growth rates. Yeah, <laughs> so it's really interesting. And yet more support that we do need more um, tagging studies in the north northeast Atlantic. You know. Yes. The, how with the confluence between those two populations that you that we see in in um I I heard some strange groaning there <laughs> um, um, between between the north and and um, from Spain and Ireland and what is the confluence between those two populations so so um that I think yeah, I'm, I'm speculating uh, right I, there's no satellite telemetry data I would like to in, in fact in three days I have a deadline for a project proposal mm -hmm. in which I'm going this is one of the the, the answers that I'll try to to answer yeah. um, so I, I'm thinking about using satellite telemetry data for sure but also yeah. isotope analysis um, trace element analysis could also give us a, an indication whether there's a actually a um, if there are two separate subpopulations, or if there's any any well, any connectivity between them, there should be some. Yeah, yeah. So I see we have a, a, a question from Hugo. Can you distinguish males and females, and how does that influence growth in data? It's, it's a very good question, indeed. Uh, normally, uh, these studies are performed separate. Well, in, in depending on the species, there can be big differences between the males and the females. Um, taking into account that usually in fish, females are larger, there should be different uh, curves. However, since we we went uh, to, to the literature to find this data, it's not possible to, to, to know if it's male or female. Right. And somehow I believe that with, the, with all the people that, at least now that presented, there's a lot more information that we can um, that we can use to construct uh, even, an even nicer curve. Mm -hmm. Also, there's the issue of Alexandrini and also Tecta, so it's it's not well. It, it's a, it's a work in progress. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. One thing I did want to add: you you mentioned the need, the how it's expensive to get aerial surveys and things like this. Um, you know, one thing we took advantage of and um, off of the the Northwest. Uh, off of Canada, Northwest Canada, um, was cetacean surveys. Yeah. Um, sur okay. sur sur um, so Rob Williams and I did a paper on on mola abundances off of um, Queen Charlotte Sound in in, um, in Canada, and just taking advantage of sightings of sunfish during cetacean surveys that are surface surveys. So that's another data source to look at. Um, yeah. Just to add in on that, those aerial surveys done around Ireland were never paid for for sunfish. The mm -hmm. Breen one is a huge cetacean survey. Mm -hmm. The ones Tom and I did were actually for leatherbacks and jellyfish. It's just you couldn't ignore the sunfish. So, yeah, there's good piggybacking. Could I just add in one word as well? Just on satellite tracking is cool, and I love satellite tracking, and most of my life is satellite tracking. But um, think about acoustic as well, because the problem we've got is – with most tags, the way they're set up, you're looking at a year's data. So when we're tagging from Ireland, we're getting them going down. They're hitting sort of Iberia, and then you lose the tag, then the animal stops. You know, you lose the transmission. Coming up, it's the same. Um, we've got a lot of stuff going on with basking sharks and skate and bluefin and lots of stuff. It could be if we've got regular locations of sunfish that we know are hot spots, if there is such a thing. 
you can get 10 year acoustic tags they're worth thinking about for actually long term monitoring yeah because that could answer your question i because I, lo I loved and I agreed with all your questions, none of which were dumb, unless we're both dumb. Um, <laughs> but it, um, yeah, I've always loved it, like the idea of you get, where the hell do they come from? How do groups form? Are groups just something that manifest in one year or do animals move around in groups? You know, and when we see them, I, I think there's so much to be learned there, but focusing on some of those hotspots, longer term technology and acoustic tags took $200. A satellite tag is 2000, you know, there's a big, yeah. that, that's what we've been doing over in, um, in the Pacific with Galapagos and, you yeah. know, the Eastern tropical seascape, you've got Cocos and Coiba and all those islands that have listening stations and it's, um, and they're operated by different, different countries and different nations. But, um, what a what a wonderful collaborative resource is for each country to have their own listening stations, and then you pull those data and you can really make some discoveries, some long lasting discoveries. That would be awesome indeed. Um, and I think I think it's a matter of um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say scientific will, but more uh, financial will, <laughs> because it, mm -hmm. although the tags could be cheaper, we still have to make the to place the receivers along the coast. And um, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, but, but I think I think it's a great idea, actually. Uh, I think it's it's I understand it's 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 better than satellite telemetry in that sense. That uh, is that it's also there's not something dragging the fish, so it's easier for the fish to swim. Um, yeah. I would say. Well, depending on depending moment. on how you do it, you can insert it or you can hang it off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's horses. It's, it's horses for courses. Like trying to map entire migratory routes with acoustic tracking. Yeah, that's a pain in, in the bottom, you know. <laughs> but if you're looking at fidelity. And whether or not, you know, the animals you get, say, in a place in the north of Portugal, do the animals go out, do the same animals come back year after year after year? It's good for those kind of questions because it gives you yeah. binary data. They're here, they're not here. Um, it's not everything. It is logistically the most demanding thing you will ever do in your life. <laughs> um, but it's a, nice, it's a nice tool in the box. It's a nice tool in the box. Yeah. yeah. Now, just going back to the to the um, the set nets, the the idea is that because the set net is always there, except in the winter, of course, mm -hmm. in the winter the, the sea is rough, so they have to take it out. But it's like nine months of the year it's there in the water. So I think we can. It's I think it would be a cheap way to 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 check the population size like uh, through the years because we have already established from the normal way to evaluate population size and then to the abundance data in the set net and we could use it forever and then we can see year to year what's the difference i'm yeah. sure you're talking to you probably know natasha who works in the lab up at queen she's done work on that kind of stuff from out in italy um mm -hmm. if not, you guys should really talk it would be because i think you have the same idea i think that's okay, great cool. yeah yeah let's do it I love cooperation. Yeah. Well, great. And Miguel, I look forward to um, your talk later, later on with the biotoxins and the microplastics yes. as well with Katya. Together with Katya, we'll try to present uh, the, summarize, the summary of our results in the chapter. Yeah, no, that, that'll, that'll be terrific. Cool. Well, and thank you for, um, thank you for offering this, this bonus talk. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. Really, really nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Great.